Having studied natural science at Downing College, Cambridge, our guest speaker tonight is an industrial chemist by trade. An interest in astronomy morphed into a burning passion when, in 2008, a telescope entered the life of tonight's speaker. With a short line of visual observing making a not unpredictable transition into astrophotography, our speaker is the chairman of the Wells and Mendip Astronomers, as well as being a member of the Herschel Society in Bath. In 2014, enter spectroscopy. And now this passion is shared by talks and courses around the country by our speaker. Just about everything we know about the universe has come through the study of waves of light. And these may produce stunning images that show that ob what that object looks like. But a spectrum will tell us what it is. So here for you tonight, reading the rainbow of spectroscopy, please welcome Hugh Allen. That's a very nice intro, Rob. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, I mean, uh, Rob, you phoned me at the weekend. I know you had a, a different plan for tonight, but I'm really glad you did phone me. I, and as you said, I am a bit of an evangelist for spectroscopy. Um, and, and I love giving this kind of talk and introducing sort of my passion within amateur astronomy. Um, and, and yeah, so I'm delighted to be speaking to you tonight. And, and I looked at your website, like I said, and very impressive facility you have, your observatory. Clearly, you've got a, a fabulous group, and, and it's yeah, it's wonderful to be able to speak to you tonight. So thanks for inviting me. Um, so I will share my screen. We we didn't have a practice first, did we? But I'm sure it'll work. Okay, sure. Okay, great. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Mm, fabulous. So, yeah, I mean it's. It, I always find it difficult to sort of get across what spectroscopy is because pe people participate, don't they, in amateur astronomy in so many different ways. And, and um, this chap here, William Huggins, some of you may have heard of, he, he's a bit my spectroscopic hero because he, 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 I think, had the same kind of passion and the same approach to spectroscopy that I do now. And he was one of the spectroscopic pioneers from the Victorian era, which we'll learn more about him and his contribution. But Towards the end of his life, he wrote this, and he wrote many things, and I have a few quotes from him. He'll, he'll speak, or well, not quite as much as I will, but we'll, we'll hear his voice in my talk. And he wrote, um, towards the end of his life, he said, the only known communication from the stars which reaches us across the gulf of space is the light which tells us of their existence. Fortunately, this light is not so simple in its nature as it seems to be to the unaided eye. In reality, it's like a cable of many strands. Let this light cable pass from air obliquely through a piece of glass and its separate strand rays all divide. And within this unraveled starlight exists a strange cryptography. Some of the rays may be blotted out. Others may be enhanced in brilliancy. And these differences form a code of signals. And it was the discovery of this code of signals and its interpretation which made possible the rise of the new astronomy. And, and this was his term, the new astronomy, that he gave to this, this branch of astronomy, spectroscopy, which of course is now absolutely fundamental pillar of professional astronomy. So he, he inspired um, the title of my talk. Uh, and, and so I, I call it Cracking Starlight's Hidden Code. And, and this is a portrait of William Huggins, you can see there. Um, and, and this is actually, I don't know how many of you have been to the um, Royal Astronomical Society at Burlington House in London. If you go right to the top floor, and, and, and I went there for a couple of BAA lectures, and, and I sort of sneaked out at one point and I walked right to the top floor. His portrait is on the top floor, one side of a pair of doors. And actually, there's another portrait on the other side, and we'll meet her later in the talk as well. Um, Rob, you gave such a nice... <laughs> Nice introduction. I always try and introduce myself a little bit to put me into context, but look, Rob explained, I'm chairman of the Wells and Mendip Astronomers. If you haven't been to Wells, it's a lovely place to come and visit, England's smallest city. Um, uh, here's Wells Cathedral, beautiful Gothic cathedral, it bathed in the evening sunshine. This is the West Front. Um, Wells and Mendip Astronomers, Wells is our kind of HQ. We, we actually have meetings all over the Mendip Hills. Wells is just in the foothills of the Mendips. Um, and here I'm observing actually in a little village called Oak Hill that I used to live in until 
five weeks ago and I just moved back into Wales. So it's a bit of a chaotic time for me at the moment. But um, uh, yeah, here I am observing, um, this is moonrise over the uh, recreation ground in Oak Hill, a little village up in the Mendips. I do have other passions. So, so I play a lot of badminton. I'm actually chairman of the Wales City Badminton Club. And I hear I'm about to serve to my wife actually. And, and I can't remember who won the rally because she's a pretty useful player. Um, and as you explained, Rob, I'm an industrial chemist. I'm, I'm actually um, responsible for the formulation of inkjet inks um, at Sun Chemicals R&D Lab and Factory in Midsummer Norton, which is near, um, near Wells. Um, but th this talk is all about spectroscopy. And these were a couple of the images, the first ever images I captured back in 2014 of spectra using my Alpi spectroscope. And we'll hear more about that. So a year or so ago, I did this little presentation of some of my spectra. Now, these, this isn't how they appear in your camera. You, 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 if you do spectroscopy in the best way, you should be using a black and white, a, a black and white, a mono camera. The, these are synthesized spectra. When you've taken the images, processed them in, in the spectroscopic software, you can then kind of uh, reproduce them colorized. So that it just kind of means a bit more, doesn't it, to people who perhaps aren't so familiar with the topic. And, and I, I put this here just to kind of show you the amazing variety of spectra that you can produce, you can see up in the, in the sky. Um, I mean, there, there are sort of certain themes here, aren't there? You know, all of the spectra, apart from one, um, have a kind of rainbow background, what we call a continuum of light. So there's a hot body, a star usually, um, that, that's producing this rainbow continuum. But you can see how the, the position of maximum brightness of that continuum is different in different spectra, isn't it? You know, some of them it's in the middle in the kind of green area, some it's in the red area, some it's in the blue violet area. Um, and this difference tells you a lot. And, and then these spectra, they're full of lines, you know, features. Some of them are dark lines, as William Huggins described, absorption lines. Some of them are bright lines, this increase in brilliancy, as he described, and these are emission lines. So they also tell you a story. Um, and, and all of these features put together uh, are what gives spectroscopy such power and importance. And, and we'll, we'll sort of meet some of this as we go through the talk. So temperature, these, this is one of the things you can see in these spectra, particularly from the, the shape of the continuum where the brightness occurs in the rainbow. Chemical composition, I'm sure many of you know, you know, these absorption lines, they're like fingerprints of chemical elements. Of course, we can observe motion, you know, the Doppler shift, which we'll see in the talk. And, and, and for me, I love watching change in the, in the sky that you can't easily see any other way. And, and we'll finish the talk by talking about the search for life in spectroscopy. And, and Please keep in mind this, you, you know, with spectroscopy, you can, you can take it to whatever level you want. And still, I believe, find it deeply interesting. You know, it, it is fundamentally fun. You, you can do hardcore science if you want. And certainly I love doing that, but you can also just enjoy it for what it is, appreciate its beauty. And I hope I can show you that too. So here's another quote from, from William Huggins at the end of his career. Spectrum analysis, he confidently predicted, could not fail to have a powerful influence on the future of astronomy. And as I mentioned in professional astronomy, that's completely without question. Amateur astronomy, I mean, it's still very much a niche, a niche within, within our kind of amateur world, but it's definitely growing, growing very fast. Um, and, and I use this phrase clouded out because I'm sure like many of you, I get, I get um, astronomy magazines each month. And, and I kind of realize there is so little, so little, spectroscopy in them <laughs> um, and and so so I bumped into the editor of astronomy now at the Astrofest a couple of years ago uh, when they were still occurring and and I said look uh, I'll write you a, an article and this is this he, he said oh, I'll publish it then. <laughs> and and this is it I, based on this talk really I wrote an article for a couple of years ago in, in astronomy now um, and I asked this question at the start of the talk and I'll ask it again at the end what does spectroscopy mean to you I mean, I, I think to start with, it probably means for many, many of, of us amateurs, you know, a kind of obscure, almost alchemical language, complex techniques, you know, blaze diffraction, grating dispersion, response correction, equivalent width, you know, what on earth is all that about? 
probably you think of physics, astrophysics. And, and of course, you can do a lot of astrophysics if you want. And, and there are some equations. And, and these are very relevant ones for, 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 for how you split the light, how you measure the wavelength, how these lines, absorption and emission lines form based on transitions in, in atoms and so on. Um, maybe the word, because it ends with oscopy, it just come, conjures up this idea of some painful medical examination. And uh, honestly, I mean, I, 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 I gave a talk to a, the local science society in Midsummer Norton a year or two ago, and, and I used the word spectroscopy in the title, which I thought wasn't unreasonable. And, and the, the, the organizer, she, she wrote an email back to me and said, look, we, we, we love the sound of the talk, but could you take the word spectroscopy out of the title because people can't pronounce it. But anyway, look, um, so let's start with a bit of history. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I really enjoy thinking about the history of a subject. I find it enriches and helps you understand the topic. So let's talk a little bit about the history of spectroscopy um, from Newton to now. Uh, and I call this the importance of the slit in spectroscopy. So I asked this question, uh, I'm sure we all think we're familiar with the sun spectrum. Well, you know, certainly living in the UK, you see plenty of rainbows. You know, this was a few years ago, I was waiting to pick my wife up after a trip at Bristol Airport. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we kind of know how spectra, the, the spectrum of the sun is produced. Yep, refraction in raindrops, refraction in a prism. You know, this is this famous um, Pink Floyd, uh, uh, album cover. I, I prefer the beer bottle version personally. Um, and of course, we, we kind of know that spectra aren't just produced by refraction through prisms, through, through raindrops. Um, they're also produced by diffraction, in this case, uh, off the surface of a, a, a CD or a DVD. A different process. This is, this is by um, reflection, or you can also do it by transmission through very closely spaced lines, when these are, of course, the grooves in the, in the CD. And, and we have Newton, of course, to thank for, for this kind of understanding of the sun's spectrum in the sense of he, he showed how white light, white sunlight, was composed of colors. And he, he did this by, by letting sunlight through a crevice, as he called it, a crack in, in, in the a window blind in his room in Cambridge. And, and he projected it against a wall um, through a prism and, and showed how you could split the light, recompose the light and so on. But he didn't observe, actually, the full beauty of the sun spectrum. And this is the point I'm trying to make. Because, you know, when we see the sun spectrum in raindrops or in a prism, the sun is a big object in the sky. So you're actually seeing an image of the sun spectrum from the left-hand side, from the right-hand side, from the middle. It's just too big. And you get all these spectra overlapping. And any fine features in the spectrum are just blurred out. Um, and, and Newton suffered from the same problem. Maybe he made his crevice too big. Maybe the quality of the glass he was using in the prism wasn't good enough. There could be many reasons, but he did not observe features in the spectrum. And, and I often wonder how the, the history of spectroscopy could have been different if a mind like Newton has had picked up on the features in the sun spectrum, as well as this, this theory of colors. Um, so we have to go to Fraunhofer to, 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 to really see the, the first major advances in spectroscopy. And this was in the time of Napoleon, you know, the, 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 us English, we were terrified of this man. He, he was working in Europe, of course, and, and, and he, he was actually a glassmaker. You know, he, he wasn't a chemist, and he used uh, the, 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 the sun spectrum to measure the quality of his glass. Um, and he was an expert glassmaker. Um, so, so he actually used the lines he could observe in the sun spectrum as a measure of the quality of the glass he was making. Um, and he wrote a paper. And, and then this is a, a hand-drawn image in his paper. So this is taken from his original paper of his spectrum of sunlight. And I mean, I love this just for the, the, the exquisite number of lines he observed. There are over 500 absorption lines he observed in the sun spectrum. So it's the red end of the spectrum on the left and the blue-violet end on the right. And, and not only did he pick up all these lines, but he actually, he actually drew this... this um, intensity versus wavelength curve, which of course is what us amateur spectroscopists do, what we output from the software we use to process the images of the spectra that we capture. Um, and he, he drew the intensity curve of, of sunlight and showed how it peaks here in this kind of yellow-green area of the spectrum. But absolutely beautiful drawing. 
And he even went further. He even pointed his little telescope set up at stars, which is amazing. And he wrote this in a, in a rather obscure journal. And maybe if it hadn't been in such an obscure journal, more people would have taken up his challenge. I have seen with certainty in the spectrum of Sirius three broad bands which appear to have no connection with those of sunlight. One of these bands is in the green, two are in the blue. And he added that he hoped to induce perhaps some skilled investigator to continue the experiments. So here we are, 150 years after Newton explained the composition of sunlight. And we're just beginning to grope our way towards the first understanding of spectroscopy. And did anybody take up his challenge? Well, unfortunately not. I mean, spectroscopy was being done in these years, but it was being done on, if you like, earthly objects, you know, looking at flames, trying to understand the chemistry behind spectroscopy. But pointing spectroscopes at objects in the universe was still not something that was widely practiced. So what happened next in spectroscopy? Well, it was, wasn't until the early 1860s, so we're now 200 years after the work of Newton, when astronomical spectroscopy took off with the work of, and these are just a few of the pioneers, William Huggins, I've mentioned, Angelo Secchi, a Jesuit priest in Italy, Lewis Rutherford, uh, uh, working in the US. And of course, these are all amateurs, you know, there weren't really any professionals back then. So they were like us in many ways, but they were probably quite wealthy or supported by the church, or whatever, in doing what they did. And, and this was the birth of what Huggins called the new astronomy. Probably other critical milestones for spectroscopy were the invention of photography and, and its use in the 1870s to capture the first images of spectra. And of course, once you've got an image, you can take your time, you can make careful measurements, you can preserve, you can record, you can compare. So, so you know, this was a very important moment. And, and then in the 1920s, gradually diffraction gratings began to replace prisms as the spectroscope of choice. And this part was partly driven by, by blazing of gratings. And all this is a physical technique to push as much of the light as possible into one of the spectra produced by a grating. And we'll come to that in a minute. And then of course, all of us as amateur astronomers know in the 1980s, the invention of the charge coupled device by these two gentlemen who eventually earned the Nobel prize for it. And, and of course we all use CCD cameras now, if you're into astrophotography. And, and well, now of course CMOS is beginning to take over. So it's, it's worth saying a few things about the production of a spectrum. So the traditional approach would have been to use a prism. Um, and, and this produces a, a spectrum with, I suppose as a spectroscopist, you could argue has a few problems. Um, I mean, it's got an advantage in that all of the light, this white light coming here, goes into one spectrum. So it makes the most efficient use of the light you have. But you can see how the spectrum is not linear. So it goes from red as the least refractive color to blue as the most refractive color, but it's uneven. And you, you, you probably didn't notice in Fraunhofer's spectrum, but the, the blue end of the spectrum is hugely widely spaced and the red end is all bunched up. Um, whereas when you go to a diffraction grating, the white light, some of it goes right through and that's called the zero order. Um, so you've lost that light and then the rest is split, not just into one spectrum either side, which is what I've shown here, but actually another one and another one and another one and another one, increasingly faint on both sides. So, so I liken it down here at the bottom to spreading a blob of butter, you know, <laughs> this blob of butter, this, this spot of starlight, it really is spread out. And, and probably, oh, I don't know, 20, 30% is all you get with a blazed grating in one of these two first orders as they're called, this one. Um, so that is made as bright as possible by this physical adjustment of the profile of these lines that make up the grating. Um, but diffraction has some advantages. The, the spectrum is linear, so it's easier to measure. Um, it's very lightweight, obviously, um, and, and it doesn't interfere with infrared and, and UV. Um, whereas glass can, can absorb and, and, and change the appearance in uh, these short and long wavelengths. So really now uh, the diffraction grating is the tool of choice to produce spectrum. And um, Chris, you mentioned that you've done a little bit with, with the star analyzer. So these are my two spectroscopes and they aren't the only spectroscopes in the world, but they're the ones I use and they're the ones I'll talk about. Um, so, this is simply like a, a thread-on filter. 
So it's it's got, you know, it, it's really simple. And as a result, as you'll see, it's very low cost. You know, you can pick up a star analyzer for a little over a hundred pounds. So it threads onto the nose piece of your camera, like a, a, a filter and, and you're away. You can start doing spectroscopy. Um, and, and this is just the, the, the kind of ruling of the grating, how many lines, how many grooves there are per millimeter. And, and the more grooves, the wider the light is spread. So the more potential you have for looking at finer features in the spectrum. So I have one of these um, and I also have an Alpi spectroscope, which has a, a more finely ruled grating and also a slit. And all I'm showing you here is an image of the slit. And I don't know if you can see it. Here it is just cut. It's basically cut into the mirrored surface of a glass sheet. It's three millimeters long and it's only 23 microns wide. And, and the narrower you can make the slit, the more focused, the sharper the features in the spectrum will be. But of course, the negative is the less light you can get through the slit. So there's a balance. And, and, and Shelyak, who, who make this spectroscope, you know, they, they've judged that the balance is about 23 microns. Um, so here we are. Here, here am I ready to do slitless spectroscopy with the star analyzer. I call it slitless simplicity. So I've threaded the um, star analyzer onto the nose piece of my Attic 314L CCD camera. This, so this is a cooled mono camera. Uh, if you do astrophotography, you'll understand the importance of a cooled camera to keep the noise down when you're doing very long exposures. And except for the brightest stars, I'm afraid spectroscopy requires long exposures because think of this blob of butter again, you know, you're spreading this starlight into really a very faint spectrum. Um, so generally speaking, you're doing long exposure photography. And here's the kind of image in a camera. So, so this is um, Albireo, this beautiful binary star that you see in the summer sky in Cygnus, you know, that has a wonderful orange blue color contrast in the eyepiece of your telescope. So here it is in, in the camera um, uh, mounted on the back of my um, telescope, which is an eight inch Mead LX90, by the way. Um, and and the, you, you, you orient the spectroscope so that the two stars are separated as much as possible. And they each throw a spectrum out. This is the bright first order spectrum to the right of the star. So you have the, the blue end of the spectrum on the left, the violet blue end and the red end on the right. And this required only a three second exposure because this is a very bright star. Here's a different field. It's got more objects in it. And remember, without a, a slit, every object in the field of view casts a spectrum. So you, you actually have to be, um, you, you have to kind of rotate your spectroscope to separate out the spectra of interest to make sure that there aren't overlapping spectra, to make sure that the spectrum you're interested in hasn't got a star in the middle of it as well. Um, and I was actually interested in this object here, which is the brightest quasar in the sky, quasar 3C273. So this is a, uh, an active galaxy over 2 billion light years away. I think it's about 14th magnitude. So it required quite a long exposure um, to produce this, even this faint spectrum. But there's help out there to understand how to make the best of a star analyzer. So you can go on the uh, RSpec website. You mentioned RSpec, Robert. The, the, the RSpec, um, this is Tom Field, who developed software to process spectra. But he has a website, and on that website, there's a kind of um, calculator, as he calls it, where you can put the spec of your setup, your telescope, your camera, and, 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 and where you're going to put the, um, the grating in relation to the camera. And it tells you whether that's a good setup or a bad and how to adjust it. Um, but if I were to give you three pieces of advice to use the star analyzer, I would say as well, you should always have the spectrum horizontal in the field of view, because then the spectrum is running in line with your rows of pixels on your camera. And that's quite important. If you have it running diagonally, you're not making best use of the resolution and you'll introduce artifacts <clears throat> when you, when you process the spectrum. Don't focus on the, zero order image of the star. So the, you, you know, you saw in the pictures I showed you earlier, every star produces an image of itself, just as if you didn't have the grating there and the spectrum. So when you focus, don't focus on the star, focus on the spectrum. And I've tried to show this here. I, I use a Batinoff mask to focus. I'm sure some of you do. 
Um, and this is a focused betting off mask image. You put it over the front of your telescope. You see, you get this nice symmetrical three pronged pattern on either side of the star. When I took away the Batinov mask with the star in perfect focus, this is one of the absorption lines. I was looking at Vega um, and you can see it's blurred, you know, it's not sharp. If I defocus a little bit, so now the Batinov mask pattern is not exactly as it should be for perfect focus on the star. And in fact, you can see the star has actually got dark center. The spectrum is perfect focused. So just beware of that. This is because the, 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 the spectrum is actually slightly curved away from the plane of the, um, uh, the, the, the focused star image. So you have to adjust the focus to get um, uh, a sharp spectrum. And don't overexpose. So many people make this fundamental mistake. They overexpose the image. And, and, and you know, generally in your software, so this is my, um, this is my uh, uh, attic software. It tells me what the pixel count is at any point in the image that I select. So you can, you can check whether you're overexposing. Uh, really important. But if we go to my Alpi, and this is my spectroscope, preferred spectroscope where possible, it's higher resolution, <clears throat> um, much more complicated, isn't it? So this is the, uh, a photo of the complete setup mounted on the back end of my eight inch Mead LX90 telescope. So you have a focal reducer to match the optics of the telescope to the optics of the spectroscope. You then have a, a white box here, which contains a flat lamp because you need to take flats in spectroscopy. If you do astrophotography, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, and you also have to take calibration images. You have to know where the position of the features in your um, spectrum image are in relation to a calibrated wavelength. So you have an argon neon lamp in here that produces emission lines of known wavelength. And, and you run a calibration image every time you take a star image and you can then um, measure precisely the position of the features in the spectrum. And then here is the slit mounted in this black box here. And I mentioned it was cut into a mirror. And the purpose of the mirror now is perhaps obvious because if you didn't have a mirror, you wouldn't know where you're pointing this setup because the light only comes through the narrow slit to your science or imaging camera here. So you have a, uh, you have a guide camera that looks at the reflection in the mirror. And, 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 and so I'm continuously monitoring the, the guide camera image on my laptop and adjusting the position of the telescope to, to follow the star and keep it on the slit, get as much light as possible through the slit. And then here in this black tube is the actual spectroscope. So the, here, this is where you have the diffraction grating, actually also accompanied with a, 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 a very shallow angle prism. Um, and um, there are, there's optics here as well. So there's a little lens here that, that makes the light collimated. So it brings it parallel onto the grating. And then there's a second lens at the other side here that focuses the light onto the camera sensor. So this is my spectrum of the sun. And actually you can't quite see as many lines in there as Fraunhofer did, isn't that amazing? <laughs> so I still don't get as good a spectrum as, as, as Fraunhofer. Um, 150 years, well, 200 years ago. Um, and, and this is the image you get of a, of a star spectrum. So, so un unless you're unlucky and there's another star that happens to fall on the slit, you only get the, the, the spectrum of the star that you're interested in. And, and, and so uh, I, perhaps I should have said, if you, if you add the cost of all this up, this is, a, this is probably about three and 3,000 pounds plus. Um, that sounds a lot, but actually, I think if you're passionate about something, it, you know, it's worth saving for and, and worth doing properly. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's £3,000 worth of kit um, compared to £100 for the Star Analyzer. Although I suppose you, you've got the Attic camera in there as well, which is probably eight or £900 these days. So what do you get for that difference in, in, in investment? Well, this is the star analyzer spectrum of Vega. This is the Alpi spectrum of Vega. And I think you can just see visually the difference in resolution of sharpness of clarity in the spectrum. So that's what you're getting for the extra investment, the extra complexity. <clears throat> you're getting much more visible features, more resolution, more capability to do interesting things. But that's not to say the star analyzer is not without interest. And of course, if you're starting out in spectroscopy, we'll look, maybe you're a bit nervous about investing 
three thousand pounds i actually wasn't i knew perhaps because i'm a chemist that when i'd done a few years of astrophotography spectroscopy was absolutely what i wanted to do and the alpi was certainly the right piece of kit for me so i actually bought the alpi before i bought the star analyzer and like any branch of amateur astronomy there's a learning curve um, I'm afraid not only do you have to learn the sort of technicalities of capturing spectra, some of which I mentioned, you have to learn how to take those spectra and process them with software uh, to, 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 to get useful information from the spectrum. And, and these are four pieces of software that you can find. Three of them are actually freeware, ISIS, BAS, which is the software I use, BAS, and Demetra. One of them, RSpec, you have to pay for. The, the advantage of RSpec, and this was written by Tom Field in the US that, that I mentioned, is that it, it's incredibly user-friendly. Of all these four bits of software, it's the most user-friendly, the most intuitive, and it has brilliant um, tutorial videos created by Tom Field. And he also has a very active forum helping guide you and, and help you through the process of learning, processing spectroscopic um, images. Um, so I started with RSpec, but I find the science capabilities of BAS a bit more useful. So I've moved on to BAS. ISIS is probably the gold standard, written by um, a French chap called Christian Buil. For some reason, France has a very strong amateur spectroscopic community. And Christian Buil is recognized probably as the best um, uh, amateur spectroscopist in Europe, and, and I think also in the world. Um, and, and he wrote this software to process spectrum. And, and this is what you get out of the software. So you're turning your, your, your spectrum image, you saw some of them earlier, into a, a graph of intensity against wavelength. And then you can do all sorts of interesting things once you've got this intensity wavelength graph. And you can see visually all, all these things. You, know, you can see these dark absorption lines as, as, as these sharp troughs in, in the spectrum. You can see the shape of the continuum that I mentioned, the, the, the brightness point in the rainbow in the shape of the, 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 the continuum on which these absorption lines are overlaid. And then of course, you can take that graph and you can do measurements on it and you can do science on it if that's what you want to do. And there, there's loads of help out there. You know, here's me with, with a lot of um, learners like I was and, and um, uh, uh, you, you know, the experts. This is Francois Cochin who owns Sheliac, who built the spectroscope that I used in LP. This is Andy Wilson who, who, who who's, um, does a lot for the British Astronomical Association. And he, he, he constructed the spectros spectroscopy database that's on the BA website. This is David Boyd, a very active um, uh, uh, amateur spectroscopist in the BAA. And you may have bumped into him at all sorts of shows as well. He's, he helps out a lot on BAA stands. And this is Robin Leadbeater, who's, who's probably one of the top spectroscopists in the UK and has given me lots of helpful advice. So the BAA is a good source of, 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 of help and inspiration. You know, they've got a mentoring scheme. So I'm one of the BAA mentors. If you're a BAA member, they'll, they'll kind of, they can help you through that, especially early journey in spectroscopy. They even have spectroscopes for loan. And I mentioned the database. So when you become proficient and, and you produce spectra of a, of a sufficient standard, you can then load them into the BAA database. And they're then available for others to use, to analyze, and even for professionals. Professionals, you know, they haven't got enough telescope time they have to come to amateurs for, for, for a significant amount of spectroscopic input on, on some of the brighter stars. And, and so spectra are frequently used in science papers from amateurs. And there are online forums, you know, uh, there are several of them. I'm a member of several. This is the RSpec one that I mentioned. So the, the, the software, this is a very popular one. Lots of, lots of members asking lots of questions. There's a BAS software um, uh, forum you know, to help you out with BAS software and so on. So look, that's enough about practicalities, the background, the, the sort of how to do spectroscopy. Let's talk about what you can achieve now. And, and I'll start because I know that, you know, many people are not familiar with spectroscopy and, and, and spectral lines and so on. You know, what, what's their origin? And I'm not going to go in deeply into physics here, so don't worry. Um, I love this quote from uh, the French philosopher Auguste Comte, who said back in 1833, there is no means by which we will ever be able to examine the star's chemical composition, mineralogical structure, or especially the nature of organisms that live on their surfaces. Well, we're gonna see that he was wrong on all three counts, of course, thankfully. And actually in 1833, 
because of the work of Fraunhofer that we saw in 1814, he was already wrong. <laughs> but people just didn't realize it. Um, so here's a quick potted summary of how these features are produced in a, in, in a, a spectrum. So on, on the left there, you see a hot body. I've called it a black body. You know, a black body is just something that only radiates light due to its temperature. It doesn't reflect any light. Any light incident on it is absorbed. Stars are, they are close to being black bodies, but they're, they're not perfect black bodies. And definitely as you get to the, the violet near UVN, they're a long way from black bodies, but they're not far off, but they produce a continuous spectrum due to their temperature. If you then have an intervening cloud of, of, of gas, if you like, of, of chemistry between the observer and the hot black body, then the chemistry in that cloud will interact with the light and, and, and absorb certain wavelengths, this fingerprint that I mentioned, um, and produce an absorption line spectrum. If you're, if you like, to the side of the gas cloud, you, know, you can almost think of it in a simplistic way as what goes up, in other words, what absorbs energy, the electrons in the atom, eventually tumbles down and that energy is re-released and, and the, 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 the wavelength uh, of emission of that light is exactly the same as the absorption. And these are perfect mirror images of each other. So if the fingerprint of, a, of, of, a, of an element or a molecule has an absorption spectrum, it has an identical emission spectrum at the same wavelength. And, and, and this was, this was, explained empirically, they didn't understand all the, the fundamental physics behind it by Kirchhoff and Bunsen. You see Kirchhoff on the left and Bunsen on the right. Kirchhoff was the, theory, the, the physicist, Bunsen was the chemist. So Bunsen provided the, if you like, the know-how to produce spectra in flames. Kirchhoff did the analysis to, to understand how these spectra were formed. And this was in 1860. And this was the um, equipment they used. So you had an oven here in which they put chemical elements, metals and so on, producing the light from the flame that came down the telescope through multiple prisms to spread the light out as much as possible into a second telescope where they observed and then they used, rotated the table with this micrometer and were able to measure the position of the line, quantify it, assign it a wavelength and understand this fingerprint and its meaning. So I love this quote as a chemist, the astronomer must come to the chemist. <laughs> um, and, and I like this idea of astronomers having to come to, to meet people like me and, and to understand their subject. And a way to understand this is, and this is really simple to do, I just took my star analyzer, I mounted it in a homemade kind of circle of cardboard, stuck it on the front of my rather old um, uh, 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 Finepix Fujifilm digital camera, went to the local firework display at Shepton Mallet and I took some photos of fireworks. And this is the first order spectrum of a red firework. And, and I mean, somebody mentioned meteor spectroscopy, I think it was you, Chris. Um, so you're kind of doing it in the same way. You're hoping that the direction of travel of the meteor, in this case, the huge long arc of a spark from one of these big banging fireworks high up in the sky is, is, is correctly oriented to produce a, a spectrum in the right way and you can pick out all the lines. And, and this is the red <coughs> emission line spectrum of strontium. And I love this periodic table produced by Tom Field, the, the writer of the RSpec software. So he, it's the periodic table of the spectra of the elements. So they all have their own emission line and if they were in absorption, absorption line spectrum. Um, so let's think about the spectrum of hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. And, and the visible spectrum of hydrogen is the Barna series that we'll see in a minute. So if we look at the plow and pick out this star, Alioth, and of course, you know, we've got the Arabs to thank for many of the star names, you know, the golden age of astronomy in many ways was, was um, in the 10s, 11s, 1200s, uh, Islamic astronomy. And, and they called this star the fat tail of the sheep or Alioth. Um, and if you look at its spectrum, it's a bit like Vega, actually. It's a star with a similar temperature. It's got this beautiful absorption line spectrum with regularly spaced lines getting more and more crowded together towards the blue, the blue violet end of the spectrum. And this is the fingerprint of hydrogen. And here's the kind of schematic of how that's produced. The, the, the electron that produces it is actually not at the ground state, it's at the first excited state in the element because of the temperature of the star. And, and then these transitions produce the different absorptions, higher and higher energies, in other words, shorter and shorter wavelengths. 
And literally, if you turn the spectrum of alley off on its end, you see how it matches this concept of the um, uh, uh, um, atomic structure of hydrogen. So you're literally looking at the atomic structure of hydrogen painted in the starlight of Alioth. Um, and now, of course, we're ready to understand the sun spectrum, really deeply understand the sun spectrum. And we can kind of repeat the work of Kirchhoff and Bunsen here. Uh, I, I know there are fewer and fewer of them, um, the sodium street lamps, but of course, this is, this is, <clears throat> these are low pressure sodium lamps. So really they only produce um, light um, by emission from sodium atoms. And the critical bright line here is the sodium line. It's actually a doublet, but my resolution isn't high enough to resolve it. So we see it as a single yellow line, um, which of course gives the street lights their characteristic color. And, and if I, if I um, uh, uh, show this spectrum uh, aligned with the spectrum of sunlight, you see there's a perfect match between the emission line from the sodium street lamp and the absorption line in the sun spectrum. So you know without question that the sun's atmosphere contains a quantity of sodium. So of course we can look at some of these other lines. Iron is an incredibly, produces incredibly complex and beautiful absorption spectra. Uh, here are just three of the absorption lines in the sun spectrum, but there are many, many iron absorption lines. Magnesium. <clears throat> there's magnesium triplet, it's called. Um, I've shown two of the lines there. There's the calcium doublet, very famous in the sun spectrum. And of course, people observe the sun in this shorter wavelength, the, the calcium K line. This, of course, is the Earth's atmosphere. You can't escape that unless you have the, an expensive telescope up in space. Um, so the absorption of light, sunlight by molecules in the Earth's atmosphere is inevitable, and it's in every spectrum. Fortunately, it tends to be at the, the red and near infrared end. And maybe some of you are saying, well, hang on a minute, if hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, where is its absorption lines? They are there in the sun spectrum, but they're really not very strong. We'll come to that in a minute. So let's get going now into space and let's look at chemistry and temperature. And I love this quote from William Huggins because you know, it's like I say, it sums up my feeling and attitude towards spectroscopy. And he said, I, I soon became, and this is in the 1860s, a little dissatisfied with the routine character of ordinary astronomical work. It was just this time that the news reached me of Kirchhoff's great discovery of the true nature and chemical composition of the sun from his interpretation of the Fraunhofer lines. This news was to me like the coming upon a spring of water in a dry and thirsty land. Here at last presented itself the very order of work for which an in an indefinite way I was looking, namely to extend his novel methods of research upon the sun to other heavenly bodies. So he, he really understood the potential, the power of this technique. And straight away, he built his own spectroscopes from prisms he worked with a, 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 a chemist who was his next door neighbor, and together they did the first groundbreaking work on the spectra of stars. And here he is, probably photographed around that time in the early mid 1860s. And here I'm going to recreate one of the early pioneering experiments he did. So this is my image that I took a few years ago of the Cat's Eye Nebula, which is a planetary nebula. So this is a dying low mass star, a bit like the sun. So this is our future. Um, shedding its outer layers rather gently as, an, as a gaseous nebula, which of course is, is illuminated by the, the, the hot remnant of the, um, the, of the dying star. Um, but that's what we understand now. In Huggins' day, there was a lot of debate whether this was a very distant clump of stars or a gaseous nebula. <clears throat> so if I put my LP spectroscope on that nebula, this is what I see, and you can see it's actually, there's, there's, there's no real continuum of light. There's no rainbow in the background. There are just these very, very sharp, what monochromatic emission lines, as Huggins called them. So at a stroke, he solved the debate, and this is what he wrote in 1864. The light of the nebula was monochromatic, and so unlike any other light I had yet subjected to prismatic examination, the riddle of the nebulae was solved. The answer which had come to us in the light itself read, not an aggregation of stars, but a luminous gas. Um, and he did many pioneering things like this in the first few decades of his spectroscopic work. 
So I'm a chemist and, and, and so I like to see the universe as a, as a sort of recipe. <laughs> so let's reduce the universe to chem chemicals, to chemistry. And this is the recipe of the universe. You know, it's pretty uniform in all directions on average. And, and, and this is what we have, you know, most of the universe, nearly 93% is hydrogen. Nearly all the rest is helium and everything else is tiny. So you may be already thinking to yourself, well, how can the tiny amounts of stuff that there are, and the sun is not very dissimilar to this recipe, how can they produce such intense spectra, you know, the calcium lines and the sun spectrum and so on? Well, I mentioned the rainbow, you know, the fundamental driver of the shape of that rainbow continuum is temperature, you know, and, and these are classic black body curves. So you have intensity up here and wavelength across. So a hotter body produces more light overall. So the hotter something gets, the brighter it gets. And we know that with stars. And it also pushes more and more of the light into the blue, violet, and eventually the hottest stars. Really, most of the light is in the UV. So this was the kind of start of stellar classification, you know, arranging stars, classifying them by temperature. And, 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 and this, this work culminated in the work of Annie Jump Cannell, who, who worked at the Harvard Observatory in the US under Edward Pickering. She was amongst the, 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 the army of computers, they were called. So these were all women who were employed to look at the photographs of star spectra um, and, and analyze them and categorize them. And, and they did fundamental work to understand. And here she's classified stars partly by temperature, um, so you see that the hottest stars peak here, the, the coolest stars peak here. But actually, she, she realized that the best way was by the strength of the absorption lines in the spectra. So here's calcium, and it only really appears in the cooler stars. Here's iron. Again, you don't see iron lines um, in, in hotter stars. Sodium, again, disappears in the hottest stars. Helium only appears in the hottest stars. And hydrogen, even though it's 93% of all the stars that are there in my slide, it really only produces an intense spectrum in these A-type stars that are about 10,000 Kelvin. The, the, the hydrogen spectrum fades in the hottest stars and really, really fades in the coolest stars. And of course, here are the atmospheric lines. They should all be exactly matched Bear with me. I mean, some of these spectra I did in my early sort of work as a spectroscopist. It's actually quite difficult calibrating spectra right down in the infrared, and it took me a while to, 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 to learn and hone my technique. And this is the graphical form of that. So I actually prefer this, but you know, you may be a more visual person, um, uh, and, and, and certainly, of course, you know, you need to, to, to use the graphical form to take measurements. So you can see the soft, uh, the hottest stars are peaking over on the left the coolest stars are peaking over on the right. And, and, and this relationship between temperature and strength of, of absorption line was explained by Cecilia payne Kaposchkin, and, and she, she explained it in her PhD. So using this understanding, she was able to say that stars were mostly composed of hydrogen um, and they didn't have a composition like the composition of the earth, for example. This was quite revolutionary. Did she get the credit for it? No, she didn't. She was forced to write in the introduction of her PhD thesis. Well, I could be wrong, you know, and it was her boss who eventually got the credit. Um, but there we are. That was the life of female scientists back then. And, and this in graphical form is essentially what she explained. So the, the, the intensity of the, of the absorption lines peaks depending on the temperature. More that, That's a more important factor than the amount of that material that's present. So let's go back to our recipe. What about molecules? Well, they were first observed, but not understood in that sense, by Angelo Secchi, one of the other pioneers of spectroscopy. And he took a spectrum of Ras al -Gethi. This is Alpha Hercules, which is actually a beautiful binary star. Lovely to see in a telescope. And this is my image of it. And I, I later on took this spectrum. And you can see this beautiful sort of chopped up bands in the spectrum. And this is characteristic of molecules. And he actually classified stars together uh, that, that had this kind of banded, beautiful banded spectrum. And these, this is the typical spectrum of cool stars that show, begin to show, they're cool enough to begin to show the spectra of molecules in their atmospheres.
you can even pick out molecules in comets. I mean, we haven't had a very bright comet, have we, until Neowise last year? Um, but this was the previously most bright one, Lovejoy, back in 2015. And I took its spectrum, and it has a beautiful emission line spectrum. Not absorption, because it's not a star. The light from the, the comet, the, the head of the comet, the tail, comes from emission. Um, and, and, and to some extent, reflection of sunlight in dust. Um, but most of the light is from emission of, of gas molecules. Um, and you can see the emission spectrum here. And I've labeled some of these bands and lines. Um, I love this. If you compare this to, to the spectrum of a gas hob flame, and this is just a gas hob in, in my house, um, they perfectly match. <laughs> so the spectrum of a comet is the spectrum of carbon chemistry. So, so you, you're actually looking at the chemistry and you kind of begin to understand the potential for comets maybe to bring life to, to, to planets, you know, in the chemistry that they contain. So of course, here's Neowise, a, a, a photo I took on a night in July last year when it appeared with noctilucent clouds. And I took its spectrum and very similar spectrum it had to, to, to um, uh, 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 the, the previous comet I showed you. And, and I even, I put the slit of the spectroscope along the comet, so I got its head and the tail in the same sort of um, spectrum image. Um, and, and I did some analysis and it was really interesting. Um, so that's chemistry. What about motion and change? And, and motion, Huggins, he was there first. He, he was looking for Doppler shift. Um, and and, and um, he, he, he was the first, he thought anyway, to observe Doppler shift in a spectrum. He, he was looking at the spectrum of Sirius. Um, so I'm going to measure the Doppler shift in the spectrum of Barnard's star, which is actually the, the, faint, the, the nearest star we can see from the Northern Hemisphere. It's, it's just over six light years away, but it's, it's, a, it's a red dwarf, very faint, very cool star. Um, so you have to take very long exposures to look at its spectrum. Now, um, whoops, just here we go. Yeah, I'll, so we'll, I'll let this video run, but I'll start commenting it when it gets to the place I want it to. Uh, here we go. This Barnard star has a huge proper motion. In other words, it moves across our line of sight. And I just did some astrophotography once a year in July. And you can see Barnard star moving across our line of sight. So when I took up spectroscopy, I thought, is it moving towards us as well? So there's its spectrum with sodium light pollution in the same image. It, it has a deep sodium absorption line in the spectrum. And if you compare the position of that with the emission line from the sodium street lamp, and I'll let the video run again. Um, you'll see that the absorption line in the Barnard star spectrum is blue shifted. In other words, it's moving towards us. Um, so using simple amateur spectroscopy, you can demonstrate that Barnard star has two components of motion, one across our line of sight, really very fast, but also, and here, here comes the comparison, a blue shifted absorption in the star against um, the, the, if you like, at rest emission line from the sodium street lamp. And if you measure the Doppler shift, you can calculate a velocity of about 100 kilometers per second. So I'll just let that run once more. So there's coming the raw image in the camera with the emission line of sodium on the same image, of course, light pollution. There's the star spectrum and there's its comparison to the emission line of sodium. And here's another beautiful piece of work. Um, so this was one of the first astrophotographs. Um, Isaac Roberts took this in 1886 of the Andromeda galaxy. Beautiful image of Andromeda, isn't it? Um, and when um, this lady, Margaret Huggins, and she was, she was the wife of William Huggins, and she wasn't his helper. She was actually his collaborator because she brought a deep understanding of this developing technique of photography. So she helped him introduce photography into his spectroscopy. And when she saw this um, image, and by the way, this is the other portrait I mentioned on the top floor of um, Burlington House in London. Um, she wrote this, Mr. Roberts' work gives the body, but if we can get good spectra, we would have the soul. And I love that comment. Um, now, unfortunately, in the end, they couldn't um, uh, detect, they, they couldn't get enough light from that blob of butter. On, on these early photographic plates, and they weren't able to measure the spectrum of the Andromeda galaxy. Had they been able to, as I am going to show you now, this is my spectrum of the core of the Andromeda galaxy. 
Um, there are lots of light pollution lines on there, by the way, those bright emission lines, they're not from the galaxy, they're from um, sodium street lamp, uh, um, you know, air glow and so on. Um, but this is the spectrum when you processed it in software. It looks a lot like a cool K-type star, to be honest, and that's typical of the stars in the core of a galaxy. They're old stars, so so they you know they're red giants and so on. But look at the um, position of some of the um, absorption lines that I've marked on here. They're all blue shifted, and just to convince you, I've also shown where the um, absorption line of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere should be, and that's bang on. And obviously the Earth that is stationary, <laughs> yeah, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so this blue shift is genuine. And when you measure it, it gives you a Doppler shift equivalent to about 400 kilometers per second. And when you look up the, the actual um, uh, velocity of uh, the Andromeda galaxy, it's, it's about 300. So that's not bad really for an amateur spectroscope. Um, and it's negative because it's a blue shift and it's moving towards us. And of course, you know, the latest NASA models say that um, the Andromeda galaxy will collide with, with um, uh, the Milky Way in maybe four billion years. Here's something else you can do with a spectroscope. So Shelyak is, is in a beautiful star field. So this is an image I took of, of Shelyak and, and its surrounding star field. Um, uh, it, it's actually a, 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 an eclipsing binary star, as some of you may know. So it, 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 its light varies as one star passes in front of the other. If you do spectroscopy on it, so this is its spectrum. It, it, it's, it's the spectrum of a hot star, so it peaks in the, in the blue near UV. It's also full of emission lines. So you've actually got two objects here. You've, you've got a star and, and, and it's got an absorption spectrum. You can see the absorption line. There's actually a second star. The, the second star is the, is the, is the um, origin of the emission lines because it's actually surrounded by an opaque um, uh, shell of, of gas. Uh, and, and what you can actually see is the emission from the gas. You don't see the star itself. The gas layer is too opaque. Um, so what you can do is you can watch <laughs> these emission and absorption lines move backwards and forwards across each other as this binary star rotates in our line of sight. And I've just shown you two of the spectra. I've zoomed in on this part of the spectrum here. So this uh, absorption line here is this one. And you can see that when the stars are oriented like this, the, the emission line from one star is, 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 is on the red side of the spectrum. The absorption line from the other star is on the blue side. If you wait two and a half days for them to be on the opposite side of their orbit, the, the star that was moving towards us is now moving away, and the star that was moving away is now moving towards us. And you can see that the lines have flipped. So with amateur spectroscopy, you can measure the, mo the motion of this binary star. And if you're not convinced that this is a physical reality, um, you'll see in this video, it is possible to separate these two stars in a professional telescope by interferometry. They're only milli arc seconds apart. And, and the video, again, they took this video. So you're seeing in a spectroscope, the reality of this motion of these two stars. You can even measure the, the expansion velocity of the supernova. So, so this was a few years ago now, we actually had two nights, you know, almost in succession of clear skies. So on one night, I took this image of the supernova in the galaxy. A few nights later, I took its spectrum. And I actually used the star analyzer for this because um, its star analyzer is very good for taking the spectra of very faint objects. Without a slit, you know, you get as much light as possible through the grating. So I used the lower resolution star analyzer and I was able to, to measure the expansion velocity of the, um, of the explosion of the supernova at 15,000 kilometers per second. Um, and you can do that with a simple 100 pound thread on spectroscope. And here's, here's I, I love doing projects, um, and, 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 but I, I love doing all sorts of different projects. And I think, as I say, like that, I'm sure Huggins was the same actually. Um, and, and this was a project I did that spanned several years. And what you're gonna see now is, is, a, is a, a, a massive star binary. So this is two massive stars, one of which has evolved to this, red supergiant stage, the other of which is, is, is um, still on the main sequence, but close to reaching the, the, the end of its life and also going into a, a red supergiant stage. Um, this is Vivi Cephei, so it's in the constellation and Cepheus. And, and uh, they, these stars always around each other with a period of 20 years. And, and so once every 20 years, I'll just play that again, the, the main sequence star, 
disappears behind the red supergiant. And we're lucky because the main sequence star has a, a, a disk of gas around its equator that produces emission lines. So we can follow this eclipse in a spectroscope by the disappearance of those emission lines as the, uh, the, the, the main sequence star disappears behind the red supergiant. I should say, by the way, that that main sequence star, if I'd really put the size correctly, you wouldn't be able to see it on this scale. The difference in physical size, the mass of the two stars is very similar. They're both about 20 times the mass of the sun. The, the main sequence one a little less, of course, it's, it, it's aging a little more slowly. Um, but, but basically they have similar mass, yet it's hugely different size because of their different stage in their evolution. And these are just three of the spectra that I took, um, showing the, the, the blue star begin to go into eclipse behind the red supergiant. And can you see the emission lines from the, 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 the hot blue star are beginning to, to fade? So this is just three of, of the 70 spectra that I captured over about three or four years. And, th and this is a, a, um, a graph of how the emission line intensity varied with time. So this time span, as I said, is four or five years across the bottom here. And you can see for about a year, the emission lines faded. Um, and, and so I've done some measurements. So I, I calculated the midpoint of the eclipse. So the period compared to the last midpoint and so on. And, and if, if you get the BAA journal, I wrote a paper about this project um, and it will appear in the BAA journal in August. Um, and, and I measured not just the midpoint of the eclipse, but many other things about this absolutely wonderful binary star. So I'll end now. I know I've been speaking for about an hour, probably another five or 10 minutes, if that's all right, Rob. Um, I think about spectroscopy and the search for life. Now, I mean, you know, we're all very excited and maybe, maybe some of these probes that are out there now. So, you know, maybe Perseverance will, will pick up some signs of life on Mars. I'm not convinced. It's a pretty pretty barren world that but maybe um, uh, I think actually spectroscopy may detect signs of life um, on distant exoplanets and even Huggins had something to say about this the differences which exist between the stars are not differences of the higher order of distinct plans of structure so there and, and, and he got this deep understanding from his spectroscopy and there is therefore a probability that these stars are like our sun surrounded by planets adapted to be the abode of living organisms. And he said this in 1864. Um, so there are two opportunities, aren't there, to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets. You know, when, when it goes in front of a star, if we're lucky, um, the starlight comes through the atmosphere. And as it goes behind the star, there's some, the, the starlight is reflected from the atmosphere of the exoplanet. Now, I can't do exoplanet spectroscopy. That is the preserve of, of, of professionals, and indeed, really, the preserve of these forthcoming giant telescopes, you know, like the extremely large telescope that the European Southern Observatory is building now in Chile. And of course, the James Webb that, fingers crossed, will launch later this year. Um, but I can give you a feel for what they're going to do. You know, I asked a question. So, you know, the planets, they produce light just by, it's just reflected sunlight, isn't it? And of course, if you look at sunlight, that's the top spectrum, and compare it to moonlight, they're exactly the same, essentially. Um, the moon has no atmosphere. If I put the slit of my ALPI spectroscope across Saturn like this, so this is the image in my guide camera, you can see the, the, the two sides of the rings produce a separate spectrum, of course, from the planet itself. And the, the rings, they're just ice and rock, so they produce an unaltered solar spectrum. But the planet, you can you see these dark features here and here? So what you're seeing is banded absorption due to molecules like ammonia and um, uh, methane in the atmosphere of Saturn. So this is spec atmospheric spectroscopy by reflection. And this is one of the techniques that will be used to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets. The other one is, of course, by transmission through the atmosphere. Now, how, how could we do that from the Earth? Well, there is one opportunity, and that's when you have a total eclipse of the moon. Um, when the moon goes into the Earth's shadow, there is still some sunlight that is, is refracted through the Earth's atmosphere, a very long path length onto the moon. And of course, we get a beautiful blood moon, don't we, during these eclipses due to that um, red light. It's like if you were standing on the moon, you'd see like a ring of sunset all the way around the Earth. Um, so I went out in 2015. I don't know if you saw this beautiful so, uh, lunar eclipse that occurred back then. 
It was 3 a.m. No one else was around. The sky was perfect. Of course, you couldn't see many stars. And then gradually, the uh, Earth's shadow crept across the moon. I took a photo with my digital camera. This was the last one I took because then I did spectroscopy. Um, and, and I put the slit across the Tycho crater because it's one of the brightest points on the moon. So I'm taking a spectrum from here. So this is the image in my guide camera, by the way. Um, and, and this was the spectrum near total eclipse. And can you see this huge scoop out of the, the spectrum? And this is ozone. And you only see this when the uh, sunlight has traveled through such a long path through the atmosphere, because ozone is really not uh, very much present in the atmosphere. And you can even see some other molecules that you can't see just by looking up through the atmosphere. And this was a, 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 a lecture I went to at Bath University a few years ago, talking about the potential for spectroscopy to, to detect these biosignatures. So, you know, if you find methane and oxygen together in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, essentially the methane must be being continuously produced. Now, there are volcanic origins and others, but there's also the strong chance that life could be the, um, the originator of this gas. So the search for biosignatures is going to be a critical part of, of professional astronomical spectroscopy in the coming years with these big telescopes. And I love this cartoon as a way of concluding. So do you think somewhere out there, aliens are measuring our atmospheric chemical composition through absorption spectroscopy? Yeah, maybe they are. So I'll leave you with this question. What does spectroscopy mean to you now? I, I hope I've shown you. It is a unique way of, of observing the universe. You know, what you learn through spectroscopy um, is, is, is quite different from some of the things you can learn through visual observation. You can do your own science and detective work. You could collaborate with other spectroscopists. You can upload your spectra to databases. So you can contribute in all these ways. And, and I hope you agree. I actually think spectra just in themselves are beautiful images. You know, we look at astro astrophotographs, we look at planetary images and we gasp. Well, I think with just a little bit of understanding, you can appreciate the beauty in spectroscopic images as well. So thank you for listening, everybody. <laughs>